Patients suffering from diseases, such as AIDS and cancer, have only one certainty, that the lifelong treatment will be very expensive. A month's dosage of Gleevec, a necessary anti-cancer drug, costs Rs. 1,20,000 in the market. Gleevec is one of the best-selling drugs of global pharma major Novartis. Is it fair that life-saving drugs are only available to the wealthy and privileged? What duty does the state have to ensure its citizens' health, particularly when it may infringe on corporate profits? Over the years, uh, uh, I, I used to sleep every day, you know, uh, drenched with any alcohol, thinking that I, I might not wake up tomorrow. That's what I've been going through. At that point of time, um, I was all alone. I was, you know, working on my own in hotels or call centers and supporting myself. And I couldn't afford, even at that point of time, the, the, the private treatment which was available. There has been tremendous amount of debate in the past few months regarding India's patent laws and the effect this has on both access to healthcare as well as on innovation by the pharmaceutical sector. The decision of the Indian Supreme Court to deny Novartis a patent for its anti-cancer drug Glivec, as well as the issuance of compulsory licenses for drugs such as Bayer's Nexivar have prompted strong reactions from those in the Western pharmaceutical industry and as a consequence from the U.S. government. Since the 1990s, U.S. trade in goods with India has flourished into a relationship with nearly $600 billion a year. The pressure on India to modify its patent regime is being slowly ratched up. Soon after the Novartis decision, the U.S. Senate Committee on Ways and Means held hearing in March 2013 where representatives of pharma companies essentially accused India of following protectionist policies in order to bolster local industry at the cost of American innovation. The pharma giants, of course, recommended firm leadership by the US to ensure that their market shares in emerging markets are not eaten into. Accordingly, the committee called on India to rethink its IP laws or face possible trade sanctions. This was quickly followed by the issuance of a U.S. Special 301 report in May 2013, which other than placing India on a priority watch list for IP violation, once again highlighted the adverse reaction of the U.S. government and pharma industry to the Novartis decision. Over the last few weeks, more than 200 American senators and congressmen have suggested that India's IP regime is protective and discriminatory in nature, and have accordingly requested the government to apply more pressure on India to make its IP policy more first world friendly. Of course, these issues dominated the recent visits of Kerry and Biden to India. The pressure being brought to bear on the Indian government by countries such as the US, who are acting to secure the interests of pharmaceutical MNCs, directly contradicts the flexibilities permitted by TRIPS, in particular, in the public health space. The 301 report and the other instances cited previously beg the question as to why bilateral pressure is being applied rather than just taking India to the WTO dispute settlement mechanism if its laws are indeed against the international norms. The answer, however, lies in the TRIPS flexibilities built into the WTO agreement. India has successfully transplanted many of these flexibilities into its domestic law and it appears is not hesitant to use them to enable easier access to healthcare for its poor people. And this has sparked off quite a worry in the Western pharma companies who see huge profits being taken away from them. So how did TRIPS act to limit access to essential drugs? Before the TRIPS agreement was signed as part of the WTO, Different countries, depending on their stage of economic and technological development, had different kinds of patent protection. They took away the flexibility that countries like India had to not provide for higher standards of patent protection and thereby allow domestic industries to produce drugs at cheaper prices. So what are the flexibilities introduced in TRIPS? They uh, were careful in trying to put in some provisions in the TRIPS uh, agreement which would not entirely sort of stop the 
impact of uh, trips in terms of uh, blocking access to drugs, but at least mitigate the impact of tri uh, trips on access to medicines. Why has India implemented these flexibilities in its domestic law? I think what India has done is not copy paste a pattern law from the West to India. And I think they've done uh, a good job in understanding some of the, the, uh, the tactics that pharmaceutical companies employ to extend pattern life. And they have really taken pains to address or close some of the loopholes. How have these flexibilities been used in the Indian law? The principal um, uh, sort of uh, health safeguards that you have, one relates to compulsory licensing. You also have the flexibility of countries uh, to determine what their standards of patentability. Uh, the Indian law, for example, also incorporates uh, provisions which allow the challenging of a patent application. You have both a post and a pre-grant uh, provision for to challenge existing applications. One example of the application of a TRIPS flexibility is Section 3D. Basically, Section 3 is a section where is a provision in India in the patent law, uh, according to which certain uh, products or processes cannot be patented. New use, for example, is one of them or new use of a known process that is also not patentable. After the 2005 amendment, one explanation was added to the effect that if a particular polymorph or a, a derivative or a metabolite or any such substance was to be patented, then in the pharmaceutical field, it is necessary to demonstrate enhanced efficacy of that polymorph over anything which is known. What does this section actually mean and how does it restrict patenting? Effectively what we are saying is, we are trying to walk between allowing the industry to patent almost any minor improvement that they make to a drug. Because we are aware that that is going to affect not simply what is patented, uh, the patented drug market, but also the generics drug market. On the other hand, we are saying, okay, we recognize that some improvements, we recognize reluctantly, that some improvements are probably arguably deserving of patent protection. But we are erring on the side of stringency. So the real question was, are we going to err on the side of stringency or are we going to err on the side of laxity? This, however, begs the question, why do we need such a provision in our legislation? In the late 1990s, a large number of such abusive patents were taken out on antiretroviral HIV medicines. Salt patents, combination patents, new use patents were granted on HIV medicines, which led to a big crisis in the AIDS area where drugs that could have saved millions um, were monopolized and kept out of the hands of patients in Africa and Asia. It was only uh, the safe haven that India had. India was the safe haven where drugs could be produced and, and they were low cost, they were quality, and then they could be uh, imported by, by countries who wanted to trade that solved the crisis of access in, in the early 2000. Mm. So I think a lot of people understand that imatinib is precisely doing what happened in AIDS in 2000. And if India is not careful, it will not only hurt Indian patients, it has a potential to hurt a large number and millions across the world. So it appears that India has put in place such provisions to prevent unethical practices followed by pharma companies to monopolize drug production. We are well aware of the fact that uh, pharmaceutical companies indulge in what is known as evergreening uh, to jack up prices and to get around the fact that their patent may be coming to an end. What exactly is evergreening and why is this bad? Shouldn't one have the right to make a profit out of one's invention? So what are we talking about when we say evergreening? If the industry makes a tweak, which it can sell as an improvement, then how is the industry going to make money from this? So one way of thinking about it is the following. The industry, because it has had unfettered brand name familiarity over the life of this blockbuster drug, right? Yeah. We, we, we call it Glivec. 
We don't call it imatinib. As a result, if the industry says now that we have a better version, what they are doing is seamlessly segueing from their brand name advantage mm -hmm. for a drug that is going off patent and using the brand value and familiarity to introduce a newly patented follow-on as a replacement. Effectively, what they're doing is changing horses midstream. Why did the Supreme Court actually hold against Novartis? What was the reasoning behind the court's decision? The patent itself that Novartis was seeking had been disclosed publicly in 1992 itself. Uh, seeking a patent years later in India again on the same um, discovery or invention as people like to uh, call it was just not something that the Indian Patent Office or the Supreme Court, court could condone. Effectively, consider what the courts in India have decided, both the High Court in Chennai and the Supreme Court uh, more recently. They have not actually made a technical judgment of their own. What they have said is, in effect, they have said that the Patent Office has not erred in making the technical discretionary judgment that the patent office is entitled to make. In effect, what the judiciary is saying is, the, we are aware that the patent office has applied an arbitrary and a stringent judgment in deciding how much efficacy improvement mm -hmm. is deserving of patent protection. However, in our judgment, by the reading of the law, this much of discretion in making that technical judgment does actually belong to the patent office. And therefore, we see no reason for us to interfere in the matter because no injustice has been done. Given the numerous and often contradictory claims in the media, how is the decision likely to affect patients as well as pharma companies, both Indian and foreign owned? You would have new technologies, new products, which were which uh, new medicines, which would come to the market. But unfortunately, most of them are, and today, even till today, are extremely highly priced. They cost you one injection, one uh, dose, costs you about two lakhs. So it's extremely expensive. Most of these doctors they prescribe these very uh, expensive antibiotics to to our patients. What they do is. Uh, let's say if, 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 a, if a doctor has been given, uh, has given you, prescribed you five days of dosage, the, the patient will go to a chemist shop, he'll ask the price, he knows that he'll not be able to afford the five, five days of medicine, what he'll do is he'll take only two days of medicine. That's, that is all what he can afford. So he'll take those two days of medicine thinking that that will cure him up and uh, he takes two days of, and because of which many Indians are getting drug resistance because of these antibiotics. It meant a large number of drugs would have got patented, which basically means that there could be two scenarios. Once uh, the drugs that are in production are in the market, those companies would face patent infringement from multinational companies and that would have a chilling effect on a local production in India and supplies to other developing countries. Fundamentally, I think the fact that you know drugs that are produced in India are used by the Indian market and Indian patients mm. um, and also procured by different government agencies, whether it's defense or CGHS. So it has a direct impact locally. Uh, number two is this that you know many, many countries, including governments, uh, funders, international agencies buy medicines from India. Indian production of generics is particularly important to enable access to drugs in other parts of the developing world, which do not have local manufacturing capabilities. This also earns India tremendous goodwill. For us as an organization that treats about 8 million people uh, a year and we have about 250,000 patients on HIV treatment alone, uh, this, is, this is a good sign. As you know, uh, patients on HIV, they're on first line drugs, they move on to second line, third line, and as uh, and these patients need newer drugs and better drugs uh, as time goes by. And the implication of this is that it, there is a possibility for generic production to continue and that a clear signal to pharmaceutical companies that they cannot just uh, 
uh, you know, file frivolous patents. Novartis claims that access and pricing are not a problem, as it provides free Glivec under its patient assistance program. But can such a program, however well-intentioned, be a systemic answer to a country's healthcare needs? India is a huge country, and, and if you look into the global aspect, there, there's so many people who need it. Novartis cannot go ahead and provide it to all the people who, who really need it. In addition, one is unsure of the criteria needed to qualify for the patient assistance program. It would be interesting to know how they pick the, uh, their clients, uh, because um, I think many of uh, the, uh, the patients aren't even aware that something like that exists, unless it's brought to their attention. Uh, by a concerned doctor or perhaps by a social worker, most of them won't even be aware of this. So, uh, did the doctors inform you about the program? Or how did they yes, they said that they have um, a section over there which deal people who need this medicine because this medicine is only for CML patients. My papers and all, everything was clear and I was informed that now I've been enrolled and and every three months I get now I get it every four months. I get four boxes of Glebeck. These programs are actually unreliable. Many times we have found in case of uh, HIV and other drugs that these programs have, ac have actually been stopped. Sometimes they have been resumed. It is also a fact that Novartis's patient programs lack reliability, from threatening to stop sales of Glebeck if pricing cuts were carried out, to random cancellations in patient programs. One doubts whether such programs are actually all they make out to be, rather than just an attempt to hoodwink the public. This is why the Novartis decision is so important. By ensuring generic production, costs are lowered substantially, thereby ensuring easier access. So our hope is that with uh, Gleevec now uh, becoming uh, more affordable, at least the state governments can step in and provide this drug free of cost uh, to cancer patients, I think, which will be the best solution. The cost is good, but it is not accessible by everyone who needs it. What the point here is that if it is being provided by the government, then it is uh, accessed by the poor and the rich equally. equally. I've been told that this medicine will be for life, so I hope that the medicine will continue to be provided to me. I'm truly grateful to Novartis and Max Foundation. Just like Ragini, most patients who have received free Glivec will undoubtedly be grateful to Novartis. However, is this an answer for all patients suffering from CML? But what I can say is that health of people or ability of a person to seek health care should not depend on the charity of pharmaceutical companies. What we want is affordable treatment. What we want to see is competition that would drive prices down and the cost of uh, research and development that they keep talking about, there's, there's no number really. Another claim made by pharma companies in the wake of the Novartis decision is that such interpretation of IP law will adversely affect innovation and pharma spending on R&D. Novartis points out to how it has spent close to a billion dollars to produce Glivec to justify its contentions. But is this true? Take the example of Glivec. People who worked on chron chronic myeloid leukemia, which is the blood cancer against which Glivec is primarily used, had no idea what sort of drug might eventually come about. All of that work is academic work spread out by government funding into multiple laboratories, some of which do more interesting work, some of which do less interesting work, all of which contribute little bits and pieces of the puzzle. But since we didn't even know what the shape of the puzzle was, it's all put together retrospectively over many years. So how can one actually put a price on the creation of a drug like Glivec? Paradoxically, all sorts of arbitrary numbers tend to get put on the creation of a new drug. The billion dollar uh, number that is bruted about 700 million, 800 million, 300 million, um, all sorts of numbers are thrown around. The reality is that a very substantial amount of the effort in actually conceptualizing the drug in terms of what is the process that you want to stop, what sort of molecules might conceivably this process, 
this is in the academic realm and it is completely chaotic and spread out. Sort of quasi-random, if you will. Crucially, is stronger enforcement of patent laws a guarantee of greater innovation? Well, I mean, even before this decision, I mean, for the past many years, uh, there has been a real concern that the current patent system is not delivering the kind of innovation that it should be delivering. Because there's this whole uh, myth that is created that this kind of patent regime is absolutely necessary for innovation. And we don't see any evidence of that. Uh, today, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows that no matter how many patents you grant in developing countries like India, the big public health issues of TB, HIV, um, and for example, malaria and Kala Azar, there'll still be an R&D gap. So the R&D ecosystem requires much more than patents. To sum up, it appears that most of Novartis's claims are hot air and the Indian government has taken an enlightened stance in implementing such legislation. The question remains, however, will the Indian government continue to stand by its people-friendly policies? That was fundamentally the issue. Would India continue to be the pharmacy of the developing world or not? I think this, no, this case has really resolved a lot of issues for patients across the world. 11 pharmaceutical companies, they made profits of $76 billion last year. I mean, this is enormous amount of profits. And what we are saying is, yes, make profits, but when you, you know, when on a balance, uh, the health of people should outweigh uh, any considerations about profit. And that's, uh, that's what we are asking for.